All right, I see everybody's still in that after lunch lull, so hopefully uh, you can get a few chuckles out of you. Huh? All right, let's do it. Uh, so my name's Isaac Orr. I'm a research fellow at the Heartland Institute, and uh, I don't know, I've kind of run the energy uh, policy gambit, done a lot of work on fracking, frac sand mining, and lately I've been talking about uh, the excessive regulation in the coal industry, and when you're talking about excessive regulation, you can't really look for a better example than what's been happening in the electricity sector as far as coal is concerned. So I just kind of want to talk about that. Um, so there are economic and human costs of excessive regulation. Uh, we're really good at getting up here and talking about millions and billions of dollars, but we're not always good at translating that into what that means for an average family. So you have direct costs. Those are borne by the industry. Uh, and we had about nine or ten Obama-era regulations uh, that were excessive and imposed on the, on the coal industry that was really harmful to that industry. Uh, but you also have the human costs that are indirect costs, and that's borne by consumers. Uh, so you have higher electricity prices, fewer jobs, especially in manufacturing, and then you have the loss of economic opportunity. So I'm going to talk about both of those things. Uh, so excessive is a very subjective term. Uh, you can try to perform some sort of cost-benefit analysis to make it more objective. Uh, if the costs outweigh the benefits, it's, it's excessive, but uh, politicians are very good at skewing what numbers you look at in order to do these cost-benefit analysis, but, you know, it's a tool in the toolbox. Um, so you had these nine Obama-era regulations. So you had the Clean Power Plan, the Carbon Pollution Standards for New Power Plants, Mercury and Air Toxic Standards, New Source Review Standards, Cross-State Air Pollution Standards, Coal Combustion and Residual Rule, Effluent Limitations Guidelines, National Ambient Air Quality Standards for Ozone, and the Stream Protection Rule. And now, rather than pull a Marco Rubio, I'm just going to take a drink of water, because that was a lot to talk about. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so this costs more than $100 billion per year in compliance costs. So this is just an insane amount of money. When you're looking at what this is, that's the entire GDP of New Mexico, sans the Heisenberg uh, effect, um, for you Breaking Bad fans. And it's also uh, the GDP of a South American country that I believe is Colombia, uh, but my geography down there isn't super awesome. Um, so let's talk about what this means in more practical terms. Um, well, first we'll talk about the clean power plant. It's kind of the case in point. Uh, so this regulation was developed to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by about 32% of 2005 levels by 2030. And the implementation cost for this regulation was between 8 and $39 billion per year and could have resulted in an 11 to 14% increase in electricity prices every single year. So if this is the clean power plan and the goal of the clean power plan is to prevent catastrophic global warming, you would want to know how much global warming this regulation would have theoretically averted. So the e models used by the EPA during the Obama administration came out and said, all right, well, this will result in a reduction of 0 0.018 degrees C by 2100, which isn't even measurable by most scientific equipment. So you have a situation where they were using co-benefits of reducing pollution from other things like sulfur dioxide, nitrous dioxide, particulate matter that can be accomplished by other means without necessarily reducing CO2 emissions. And they were using that in order to pad their stats when they were looking at their cost-benefit analysis. So this caused a retrofit or retire decision. So you had uh, more than half of the coal plant in the United States have either retired or they have been announced that they will retire by or since 2010. And a lot of these were older, smaller coal plants. 88% of them had generation capacity less than 100 megawatts. Uh, so these were ones that were candidates to retire anyway, just because they were old. But when you go forward and you start retiring younger, newer power plants, then you have a situation where you're increasing the cost of electricity for everybody else. And that is going to be something I talk about right now. Um, so, on average, existing coal-fired power plants can uh, produce electricity for about 40% less than new natural gas, and about two and a half times cheaper than wind, three and a half times solar than, or cheaper than solar. They're not solar than solar, they're more affordable than solar. Uh, so when you look at the states that are most affected by this, Midwestern states, uh, I'm from Wisconsin, so that always sticks out to me. but. Um, when you look at the electricity bills, I guess look at California. They, they get about 4% of their electricity from coal. That's all imported from Arizona. So 
um, the electricity rates in California have increased dramatically since they've tried to introduce a lot more natural gas and wind and solar into their into their grid. So you see industrial uh, electricity prices are 79% higher than a national average. Commercial is 49% higher than a national average. And residential electricity is 34% higher than the national average. So that's a significant increase in electricity prices over a very, very short time span. Um, and then this is actually hurt manufacturing in California. You have a lot of large companies that are leaving or putting their energy intensive uh, processes like Google and Facebook are putting their server farms in other states with lower electricity costs and then they just say they're spreading the wealth. Well, they're cutting their costs as well. Um, so you see that California is actually lagging the national economy when it comes to put growing manufacturing jobs. So look at that again. Uh, take a look at all the states that have the darkest blue uh, and then let's look at the states that have the deepest green because those are the states that have gained the most uh, manufacturing jobs over the last seven to ten years, so kind of back and forth. Um, there's a really big correlation between the states that have decreased their coal consumption the most and have also lost the most manufacturing jobs, and that's because their electricity prices have gone up. So you have Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, and in the top four, four states that have grown their manufacturing base the largest, and they also tend to uh, rely on affordable electricity generated by coal. So. Uh, when you're talking about imposing additional costs on the coal industry, these are the times or types of things that you're threatening. Uh, and it's, it's the worst for low-income households. Every, every regulation is kind of regressive in that way to where it hurts the people that can afford at least hurts them the most. Uh, so the EIA estimates that the average family spends about $1,300 for electricity in 2017. If you got rid of the coal and nuclear plants that are online right now, you'd be increasing that to about $1,700 a month. Um, so when you think about what is, what is $364, uh, so that's 50 hours of work at the federal minimum wage. Uh, this is time people could be spent spending doing other things like hanging out with their kids. Uh, studies have shown that reading aloud to your kids is the best way to increase their educational outcome uh, in school. Uh, it's also a good way of reducing obesity rates, because if you eat out more often, which you do if you work more, uh, you don't eat healthy. So uh, low-income households have the highest rates of obesity, and that uh, seems counterintuitive, but it makes sense. Uh, and then I, liked, I looked at this, and I thought this was interesting. Christmas spending for 2015, 14% uh, of households spent between $250 and $500, and 19% spent more than or less than $250 for their Christmas budget. You're essentially asking people to get rid of their Christmas budget, not that they wouldn't find it at other places, but uh, just so they can pay more for their electricity. It, it doesn't make any sense. You're decreasing the value of their, their goods and services, their electricity. So uh, I know from firsthand experience, I bought an apartment building in Wapaka, Wisconsin, my hometown. Uh, and if you were to increase the rents there by, let's say you took out all the coal-fired power plants and you replaced them with new natural gas, you're raising their property or their electricity bills by 40%. Uh, a lot of the people that I, uh, Wapaka is a manufacturing town. Uh, if you know the foundry business, you know Wapaka because it's the home of the largest gray iron ductile foundry in the world. It's a $1 billion company in the middle of a town of 6,000 people. So it's the largest employer in the county. If you raise electricity prices, you threaten the, the uh, economic well-being of not only the people who live in town, but also their jobs. So. Um, I have tenants that have a hard enough time paying their rent, and if you increase their electricity bills by 40%, uh, it's got to come from somewhere. Um, so it's also been bad for coal mining communities. Between uh, 2011 and 2016, we lost about 36,000 jobs uh, in the coal industry, and 90% of those were in Appalachia. And the loss of the jobs is significant because if you have an industry that's paying people about $82,000 per year in benefits and salary, that is just a tremendous amount of money for people that don't go to college and don't go for further education. You can't replace that unless you have some sort of uh, high value added uh, in, or sector like manufacturing. So um, making electricity more expensive, less competitive, these are all counterintuitive to trying to get uh, high paying jobs for you know average people. Um, so cost of coal mining communities, Bud showed this earlier, and the decline is mostly due to uh, advances in technology. If you looked at you know, what it took to harvest a field, uh, it, the graph probably looks really similar. Um, so what can be done? Uh, the Trump administration's done a really good job 
of rolling back these regulations that I talked about earlier. Uh, so we'll see what happens on the carbon pollution standards for new power plants, but the clean power plants begun to be rolled back. The mercury and air toxic standards has already been implemented, so uh, that one's kind of, the damage has been done. Uh, new source review standards also needs to get taken, uh, taken to task. <laughs> um, uh, Cross-state air pollution, coal combustion residual was uh, delayed, the effluent limitations guideline was delayed, and we'll see what happens. Wow, five more minutes. I talked way faster than I thought I was going to. Uh, so we'll talk about the conclusions. Uh, the Obama administration has imposed a lot of uh, excessive regulation on the coal industry, and I think you can kind of look at the cost-benefit analysis and kind of see, all right, well, it looks like we're increasing the, the cost of electricity, uh, but we're only getting very negligible benefits if your standard of value is, all right, are we going to prevent any climate change? And I don't think you can say, yes, we are. Um, so. The costs are excessive and it hurts manufacturers, low-income households, and coal communities hit the hardest. Uh, and so far, uh, it's been so good for the Trump administration and trying to preserve at least the coal industry. I don't know whether those coal jobs will come back because manufacturers are always looking for new ways to reduce the amount of people that it takes to increase their output. So uh, that's, that remains to be seen, but you know, at least they got a shot now. So thank you very much.